Welcome to Marin Voices and Views. With Lawrence A. Strick, I'm Peter B. Collins. In our second segment today, we'll be talking about the changing world of libraries and books with Sarah Houghton, director of the San Rafael Public Library, also known as the Librarian in Black. Right now, Frank Egger returns to our program. After years on the Fairfax Town Council, including seven terms as mayor, Frank was recently elected to a full term on the board of the Ross Valley Sanitary District. He co-founded Friends of the Eel River, served on the Coastal Commission, and is a longtime environmental activist. Frank, let's start with the Ross Valley Sanitary District. You're working sure. to clean up a couple of messes over there, not just spills. The district recently got a $3 million loan from the county after Central Marin Sanitary Agency refused to defer payments. Why did that occur, and why is it necessary to borrow? Well, it's interesting. You know, this, this agency w was on a spending spree, and uh, um, last year when we were putting these projects out to bid and, and, and signing these contracts, I kept asking, you know, uh, do we have the money to pay for this? Uh, it's not budgeted. And Oh, the board was assured that there was funds to pay for it all. Uh, millions of dollars in contracts, and um, uh, m many of them were approved on three to two votes. There were two of us saying, you know, uh, you need to show us the, the dollars. We need to know there's money to pay for the, these projects. Um, granted, the projects need to be done, but if you don't have the money, how can you have a contract for projects? And, uh, and the district spent money it didn't have, and uh, uh, come October, November, uh, we were unable to, uh, to make our payroll. It got that bad. Hmm. Um, so this was an agency that was teetering, teetering on bankruptcy. You know, it, it is a public agency that takes in nineteen and a half million dollars a year in, in, in tax revenue, and uh, unable to pay its bills in, in, in November. I mean, uh, it was crazy, and so we were out trying to find money and um, looking at, um, at uh, banks for loans. Uh, Talk to the Central Marin Sanitary Agency and uh, and talk to the county in Marin and, and it's a it's a countywide investment fund. It's not just it's not just it's not the county's money, but it's an it's it's public agencies um, that come together in the county and invest their funds with the county of Marin and the county goes out and and invests that money and secure you know secure 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 waste for for interest bearing accounts and uh, and so we were able to secure a loan from, from them, a temporary loan from them for $3 million. Mm -hmm. And that's allowed us to make our payroll to pay our bills. All right. And you've been in a struggle with the Central Marin District, and in particular over who has the rights to take the effluent from San Quentin. Uh, is peace is at hand? <laughs> and what is going to be the uh, upshot of the San Quentin uh, franchise, if you will? Sure. There, um, there were two legal issues that we were involved with with Central Marin Sanitation Agency, and um, and the relationship was was not, had gone sour, uh, to put it politely. Um, and with the election in July, and and then they named me the president. Okay, Frank, here you go. <laughs> um, you know, I I've spent the past uh, uh, four months mending fences, all over the place, with our cities, the board of supervisors, uh, with Central Marin Sanitary Sanitation Agency. And, uh, and we have settled uh, one of the two uh, legal, legal actions we were involved with. And, that and there's still one pending, and that's the San Quentin one. Mm -hmm. Ross Valley had, had provided those sewer services to San Quentin for well over 30 years, close to 38 years. And um, uh, I guess the rates had gone up before I came on the board. And then last year, uh, we were looking at the amount of effluent uh, wastewater generated from San Quentin, and, uh, and it, our, our, our manager, uh, Brett Richards, said uh, he thinks they're being overcharged. And so we did a study, and we lowered their, their cost uh, about a million dollars. And um, uh, at the same time, they said they're being overcharged, and so they went looking for a better deal. And they found one at Central Marin Sanitation Agency. Um, the, 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 um, the wastewater comes from San Quentin into our pipes, into our pumps, and then over to the Central Marin Sanitation Agency. And so there's an issue there as to, uh, number one, uh, did the state have the authority to, to go out and contract uh, with another agency for, for sanitary services? So, I mean, um, we've been providing them for well over 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're using our, our pipes, our pump, and if, if something blows out, um, 
uh, we're going to be liable here. Uh, the state's not going after San Quentin for a spill. They're going to come after us because we have to own the pipes. And so there's some issues here, issues here that have to be resolved. We think it should have gone out to a, a competitive bid process that, um, um, that the state did quite handle it fairly. And, 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 and I've always been about fairness and equity here. So we're just trying to get a fair, fair shake for all of the ratepayers. We don't think that the Central Marine Sanitation Agency should be subsidizing, subsidizing the State Department of Corrections to the tune of a million dollars a year. That's, that's a deal they cut them. Hmm. Frank, Britt Richards, uh, who was the general manager of Ross Valley, abruptly quit and moved on to Florida. Uh, that's after he got a rather generous housing allowance uh, from the district, uh, but he never bought the house. Uh, there must be some outstanding issues there. One, is, the, is Ross Valley going to get its money back, and what's the status of that problem now, if it's a problem at all? The, uh, the district attorney's office has taken that, that issue on, and they're conducting a full investigation on the $350,000. Um, they're interviewing a lot of folks. They're, they're trying to get, get to the bottom of it. Um, we, of course, uh, uh, are determined to get the taxpayers $350,000 back. Um, the, the, the contract uh, was a fairly loosely written contract that allowed a housing allowance of $350,000. Um, and that money was wire transferred from our public bank account to, to the, uh, the manager's personal bank account. And um, um, evidently the in Marine Independent Journal did, did, uh, did some investigation and they said there's no house. Uh, that money wasn't used to purchase a home. I, I looked for a second deed of trust held by the district, figuring, well, if we loan the money, there must be a second deed of trust on a home that, that you know, it's secure. And there's no second deed of trust. Now, that money's not secure. So, um, so it's, it's missing money right now. It is. And he's gone. Yes. And you're looking for a new general manager, or have we you are. had one? No, we're looking for a new general manager. How's that we, process we going? Um, we, we, we advertised, we had a number of applicants, um, and we windowed it down to four, and, um, um, and we're in discussions with two of, two of the four. Um, we have no one on, on board yet. We're hoping perhaps in December we may have uh, an announcement that, that we have, have uh, come to an agreement and, and uh, found uh, a, new, a new general manager. But we're going to know here in the month of December whether or not that's, that, that, that happened. And we'll, we'll make a, a public announcement, of course. And uh, uh, what, what, what the district has changed. The district is doing a lot of, uh, of, uh, uh, of public notices and a lot of uh, public information is out there. And we're, uh, we're very accessible. If anyone wants to talk to us about any problem, we're here. We no longer dodge the press. Um, and so uh, it's kind of a new day at Ross Valley Sanitary District. It's a, it's, we, we put on a new face, a new persona here. And, uh, and, and, the, and the ratepayers are reacting uh, kindly towards us. Frank, in November, there were two sewage spills in San Anselmo, one of which was pretty big, about 88,000 gallons, even though the initial estimate was only about 2,000. Is your staff on top of these problems when they inevitably occur? We, we are. We actually are. It turns out uh, that, that, uh, that spill, it ran for four days before anyone called us. And it was running on private property uh, in a back canyon uh, coming off the hill of San Anselmo down towards uh, Butterfield Road. All get all on private property in a canyon. And unless someone gives us a call, it, it, those those sewer lines aren't in public view, and we don't we don't we don't know what's happening. Um, we did see a video on Channel Seven News that where they interviewed a neighbor who, who said it's been running here for four days. Gee, I wish they'd have called us because as soon as we get the call, we respond day or night. I mean, you know, we're, 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 we respond. Um, the estimated 88,000 gallons was uh, was as a result of what the neighbors said. It said it ran for four days. Uh, we counted the homes. There's 100, and, I think about 127 homes, uh, 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 115 to 120 maybe homes above that above the break, mm -hmm. and we multiplied out. I think 150 gallons a day per home. That's how we arrived at 88,000 gallons. We had no meter on it, we, and, and and it's really not obvious that there was that big of a spill, but we just calculated out the number of homes above the spill, and and per, by by uh, uh, 150 gallons per household. And in um, and, and four days, that's where the 88,000 mm -hmm. came from. The second spill was a, a contractor drove, drove, a, drove a stake into our pipe, didn't tell us. 
We, we got on it very quickly, and it was it was fixed the first the first day. I, I want to switch gears a little bit to um, something about the water district itself. Sure. And uh, you ran for that position some time ago. I did twenty and, in in two thousand ten. And you at that point were an opponent of the desalization plant and the issues. Uh, the water de water department just unveiled a new plan for its management, and it's pro proposing using herbicides such as Roundup to control some of the French broom growth. Um, the spraying would leach back possibly into the water supply. What's your view of that and where's that headed at this point? That was also an issue in 2010 when I ran for the water board. And th those are my two, I actually had three primary issues. One was uh, 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 a no desalination. We would not take water from polluted Sa San Francisco Bay and try to clean, clean it up and deliver it to folks. The other one was, was no pesticides on the mountains. Uh, they had been spraying pesticides up until 2005 when Fairfax, uh, as a result of my investigation, uh, put a stop to it. And um, uh, they've been studying the issue since 2005. You know, the previous director, um, uh, Mr. Helker, came from the Department of Pesticide Regulation. At, at Sacramento, so he was very familiar with the water pesticide. department. The water department, yeah, water, water, yes, yes, the municipal water district. Right, and so they they had been trying to re, to restart that pesticide program for a while to get rid of the Scotch and French broom, and I was opposing it in 2010. So, as it as it comes out now, it's nothing's changed. Um, my attitudes haven't changed. In fact, uh, the more we find out about glyphosates and Roundup type pesticides. Uh, uh, the more concerned people are getting that they should be put in, in, a, in, a, in a watershed at all. So, Frank, the numbers are, they say that it would cost about $6 million to just clear all of this brush. That's annually. Spraying would cost about $1.6 million a year, and they say their budget is less than a million a year, about 800000 So what do you see as the best way to manage these invasive uh, um, brush uh, creatures. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, we have to take a close look at those numbers. The town of Fairfax has almost 30 employees, and its annual budget is six and a half million dollars a year. So I'm not sure where they're getting this six million dollar figure for, for managing uh, uh, the, the scotch broom on the mountain. I, it seems they could hire an awful lot of employees for six million dollars, mm -hmm. and, and uh, I haven't seen the, 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 how the numbers break down, what percentage is employee, what percentage of benefits, et cetera. Um, but it seems to me that um, they, could, they could do it much cheaper than $6 million a year. Are, are there alternatives such as uh, controlled burns or some Absolutely. other process they could use to, to, to do it in a more efficient and cheaper way? Absolutely, controlled burns is one of them. Um, uh, hand pulling, they, they've, got, they've, got, uh, they've got big hand pullers that, that we could get crews up there. Um, you get the California Conservation Corps up there pulling broom. Um, it, nowhere, it would come nowhere close to six million dollars a year, and um, and the idea of, of, of you know the, the so-called safe pesticides. Uh, I don't think there's a safe pesticide out there, and um, um, yeah, and, and 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 while while pesticides may have its place on private property. I would hope public agencies are, don't use don't use poison. Well, but in particular on a watershed. In our, our drinking water. <laughs> I mean, that we, just it's seems like a no-brainer. Yeah. Well, Frank, thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I know you don't get paid uh, very much. What, a hundred bucks a meeting at the sanitary district? Well, listen, no, no. Actually, it pays more. Oh yeah. It's it's it it is two hundred two hundred and fifty eight dollars a meeting. Okay. Well, still, um, that's a modest amount for all the time and effort that you put into uh, protecting our interests, and I want to thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Frank thank you. Egger, thank here you. on Marin Voices and Views. Joining us now is Sarah Houghton. She is director of the San Rafael Public Library, whose bricks and mortar are located at 5th and E Streets next to City Hall, and they also have a library at the Pickleweed Al Boro Center in East San Rafael. And they have an online presence at srpubliclibrary.org. And Sarah herself has an active blog at librarianinblack.net. Sarah, great to have you here. Thanks. It's good to be here. I wanted to get your take because I think you have an interesting perspective on the changing world of books and libraries. And tell us what your own vision is of the library of the future and how you can continue to serve the Luddites who want to take a book and hold it in their hands and read it page by page. 
Uh, I wouldn't call those people Luddites. That's still the bulk of our users prefer the, a, a printed book or a physical a media of some kind of book on CD, for example. We're seeing more and more people adopting the digital format, though. And as we get more and more younger users, those are the people that we're seeing asking for that as their preferred format. And if they can't get it digitally, they won't even use it physically. So what we're doing at, at libraries today is trying to build parallel collections as much as we can by the same title in a physical format for people as well as in a digital format for people who prefer it that way. And so that means the money goes half as far uh, in terms of the number of different things we can buy. But we're doing our best to, to buy as much as we can. So I think for the future we'll see more migration toward digital content because it is easier to use. It doesn't mean you, you don't have to come into the library to use it. You can get it from home from work, on your mobile device, wherever you are. So it doesn't require that, that physical presence that it does now to come and pick up that physical item from, from our building. Mm -hmm. It sounds like that's the plan for libraries and your library in the future is to have uh, a variety of medias that people could use. Do you see the demographic of your library users changing? And with the cost of books being at $24 a copy, uh, are there greater or lesser numbers coming through your doors? We've seen usage of our services grow dramatically uh, since the economy took a downturn, and this is a nationwide trend in public libraries uh, that our, our community has upheld as well. And that goes for checkouts, it goes for attendance to our programs, it goes for computer use, particularly as more people either become homeless or can't afford internet service at home anymore, they're relying on us as their place to get that connectivity to find a job or to write their resume or look for schooling options or housing options. So we're seeing use go up and up and up, and that's been a yearly trend that we've seen continue. So I don't anticipate the use of our physical services really declining. That's continued to increase. It's just that digital use is exploding and just about doubling or tripling every year. So uh, the, the increase there is dramatic. Now, Sarah, I've just started to read books on my iPad, so uh, I'm still exploring the world of ebooks. Can you tell us what your collection is like? Uh, simply, you know, how do you access it and download it? And how does it affect the concept of borrowing? Do I have to give back an ebook after I've borrowed it from your library? Uh, it depends. So we have several different collections of ebooks. Uh, we have one collection through an organization called the Internet Archive, and that collection is called Open Library. And that collection, you borrow it in whatever format you prefer. They've got a ton of formats that will work on different devices, so it's not device limited at all. And then when your, your loan period is over, which is uh, three weeks, it just kind of self-destructs Mission Impossible style mm -hmm. on your device. Is there smoke and everything? There, no, there's no <laughs> smoke. It's invisible smoke. Uh, and, and our other collection is through another company. And that collection kind of works the same way. You'll find more bestsellers in that collection. But our biggest challenge in libraries right now is most of the big publishers that publish the bestsellers won't sell to libraries at all. And so we don't even have the option of getting many of the bestseller titles that you'll see on the New York Times bestseller list or on the Chronicles list or anywhere else. You, you can get a hard copy, you just can't get an ebook. They will, are more than happy to sell us hard copies, but mm -hmm. they will not let us a have access to digital copies for our patrons. So mm -hmm. the few publishers that do still license or sell to us uh, charge us three or four times as much as they charge the consumer for the same title or they'll have a copy that will self-destruct after it loans out to 26 people and then the library has to buy a new quote-unquote copy. Mm. Uh, and so things are different than they are with physical books, uh, but we are doing our best to get as much as we can. It's just our selection is very limited right now because of what the publishers have, have chosen to impose on us. And, so, and excuse me, Larry, yeah. but if we make you queen of all publishing, how would you sort that out? Uh, what is the right way to provide you know, appropriate royalties to the publisher and the author while making these titles widely available. I think that there is a formula of financial reimbursement where the library is paying a fair price but not paying four to five to six times as much. When I, I'm, I'm seeing an audiobook and they're asking $200 for it for a library but I can get the same thing as a consumer for 30 it's hard for me to justify spending those kinds of funds on, on one book, one title. 
Uh, so I think that there is a way for publishers and libraries and authors to come together and find a fiscal solution that works for everybody. It's just those, those talks are happening, they just haven't come to a positive resolution yet. So your budgets are being stretched because you have to buy two different media of each book. Your services to the, to the folks in San Rafael are, are increasing. How are you affected and how do you get your money to run the library? Are you getting enough? What mechanism is in place for you to, to maintain what you get? And are you looking for angels? We're always looking for angels. Uh, yeah, that's the public. Uh, that's good. That was good. <laughs> our, our budget at the San Rafael Library is funded two-thirds through the general fund from the city. So that's through sales tax as well as property tax funds. We also passed a parcel tax measure in 2010 for San Rafael that substitute or supplements the rest of our budget so a third of our budget is actually from that parcel tax which was called measure c and if we didn't have that money we would probably have to cut our hours in half and lay off a good third to a half of our workforce uh, and so it's it's only due to the graciousness of san rafael voters that we're able to stay open and have as many books and hours as we do now very interesting now uh, how do you at the library connect with other libraries with schools and with parents and community groups to build the, the kind of storytelling and information sharing community that uh, we envision? Well, all of the public libraries, as well as Dominican University's library in Marin, uh, we're all part of one group called MarinNet, and we share as many resources as we can. Our online catalog is, is one big merged shared catalog. We share our ebook collections, we share online magazines and newspapers. All, as much as we can share, we do. Uh, and we communicate really with the schools in our own jurisdictions and reach out to them as much as we can. Since many of the school librarians have been let go, we're now in a difficult position where we're acting as ad hoc school librarians for the students and providing them a lot more curriculum support than we used to need to. Uh, we're happy to do it, but it is one more stretch for us. Uh, we do reach out to homeschoolers, parent groups, and others through just a lot of one-on-one -on -one group meetings and individual meetings. It's an ongoing effort. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that uh, you also, in addition to your duties as librarian, you have a blog. And it's something like stuff that librarians say. Tell us a little bit about that and you know, what kind of audience do you have? Uh, so the blog's been around for almost a decade at this point. It's Librarian in Black. And uh, I'm currently running a video contest asking library staff to submit little videos of themselves saying many of the stereotypical things that we say in libraries. And that is not shh. We don't shh anymore. Most of us don't shh anymore. <laughs> uh, but we say lots of other things uh, over and over again. And uh, it's, it's uh, funny, supposed to be funny once it comes together. And I'm ho hopeful that we'll get uh, more submissions. So that's my current project is putting that together. Any good examples of uh, things that librarians say that are repetitious, cliched, or funny? I need chocolate. We say that a lot. <laughs> okay. I guess you don't have to be a librarian to say you that. You don't. Yeah. You don't. But it is something you hear daily. Yes. So Sarah, are attention spans declining as people can do a search online and get a specific bit of information without having to pick up the book where it's contained in and get the context and maybe even be uh, led into something they weren't expecting to look at? I've seen conflicting studies on whether or not attention spans are actually decreasing. We see that people are able to juggle multiple small attention focused tasks at a time now that that wasn't necessarily a skill that people have had in as great a quantity as, as we do now. Um, I, I don't think that the advent of the internet or the advent of online information has changed people's ability to really get wrapped up in a good long form story and get sucked in and, and enjoy it. So we still see readers of all ages enjoying books just the way that we did when we were little kids. Hmm. What's the plan for San Rafael uh, Library in the, in the holiday season and in the coming year? Uh, well, this holiday season we've got three big programs coming up. Uh, we've been running a po really popular genealogy search class that has been full to overflowing every time we've offered it. So now we're actually taking sign-ups in advance because we hate turning people away <laughs> at the door. Uh, but the fire marshal only lets you know so many people in the room at a time. Uh, so that's going to be on December 10th from 2 to 3.30 at the downtown library. And we'll teach you how to use uh, some of the tools we have, like Ancestry.com, which mo you'd have to pay for as an individual. But we 
manually pay so you don't have to. You just come into the library and use it there, as well as some of our other genealogy search tools and some of the free web tools that are out there. Um, December 13th, we're teaching a class on our online investment tools. So how, if you're looking to manage your stock portfolio or your mutual funds, how to use some of our online tools to, to better make your money, make you more money. Uh, that's a class I want to take. <laughs> uh, and then at the beginning of January, January 2nd, we're having one of our very popular monthly art talk series. Uh, and this is Rudolf Nureyev, A Life in Dance. And that's going to be uh, hosted by a docent, uh, Julia Geist, from the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. And those are always packed to overflowing, and we hold those at City Hall. And that would help people enjoy the exhibit that's in San Francisco? We always coordinate the art talks with the current exhibit. So if you come and see the art talk first and then go to the exhibit, you really can get a lot more out of it, yeah. Sarah Houghton, thank you for joining us today. Again, your website for more information is srpubliclibrary.org, and Sarah is the director of the San Rafael Public Library. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me.